particular pleasure to introduce Kevin. I've known Kevin for a whole lot more years. When we would remember that Kevin had red hair and I had some hair. <laughs> I knew him at a time when Kevin used to eat a box of cereal for breakfast, just a whole box by himself, and we would time him from the time that the secretary, the red secretary, would announce. in I think a record of 1 minute 32 seconds from the time that he holds out. I, I, I timed that once myself. Of course, uh, Kevin is known for many other things. <laughs> so since uh, getting his PhD in Carnegie Mellon in uh, the early work in snake robotics, um, he has gone on to doing a whole bunch of other stuff. He led one of the, he was part of the leadership of a startup companies when startup companies from robotics weren't quite the thing. Um, and uh, a few successes there. He has been in Boston. And uh, imagine my surprise, I got, about a month ago, I, I got an email from a friend of mine about an article in Forbes magazine that had Kevin in it, and citing the how wonderful Pittsburgh was, and I was shocked to find out that Kevin would actually move back to Pittsburgh, and he's now leading the company. And about an hour later, through some synchronicity, I got an opportunity to host him, so I'm very, very happy. Uh, I jumped on it right away uh, to introduce Kevin, and uh, especially since he's got this fascinating topic, which is basically a crash course in robotics from somebody who has been there or as a grad student. And, before he was an engineer, a grad student, an uh, entrepreneur, head of engineering, and now leading one of the fast moving companies in Pittsburgh. So please welcome Kevin Dell. Thanks, Sanjay. That was very nice. Uh, it is actually great to be back in Pittsburgh. Uh, I was in Boston for about 15 or 16 years, uh, a length of time where my son. Uh, who was an infant at the time I left here after finishing my doctorate to where he's now in his junior year in high school. So it was quite a, quite a change. Uh, he, he's still getting used to Pittsburgh. My daughter, on the other hand, went here undergrad and she's in graduate school here now over at the Heinz College. So very proud of them. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about different things rela related to startups, of course, but also to point out that um, th this comes from a uh, very famous screenwriter, William Goldman, he wrote uh, the scripts for Princess Bride, uh, All the President's Men, Marathon Man, a whole host of, a slew of uh, movie hits. Um, what he was referring to here was, no one knows what it takes to make a successful film. But as I, I read his book about it two years ago, and uh, he wrote a couple of books called Adventures in the Screen Trade, which are a fascinating look at the movie industry from the inside. And the point he was making, I think, also applied to uh, venture capital and small companies, in that you don't know what will succeed. I mean, who knew that two grad students at Stanford who started a little search engine called Backrub, which I can remember using as a grad student, that later turned into Google. Um, and of course, that was a, an incredible success. Or Facebook at Harvard, similar story. Uh, but who knew which ones? Because there were thousands of other startups. And, it, and the equation for making a successful startup is completely, is not known. Right? What are the coefficients? What are the variables? Uh, but there are certain things that you need to have in order to be successful. And there is some commonality between the successful companies. So I'd like to trace a little thread uh, through some of my career and what made good startups and bad startups. And some of them, although they look great from the outside, were just a roller coaster on the inside. And it's uh, really interesting to sort of trace how companies do, what makes them successful, what makes them fail. Because failure is actually more instructive in many ways than success. Entrepreneurs who are often very successful in their first startup uh, are, are not that great at being serial entrepreneurs in some cases because they don't understand why they really succeeded, whether it was a combination of luck, connecting with the right people, the right financing, and so forth. So I'm going to go through some of that today, talk a little bit about my background. So in college, uh, a friend, some of you may remember Mike Blackwell. Uh, he and I were great, still great friends. And uh, we started a little thing um, just after graduating undergrad, and I started working in robotics called Dryas Enterprises, uh, make, basically making a new kind of keyboard. 
Uh, I'll, and I'll talk about what the outcome of that was. I also, in the mid-80s, worked with Henry Thorne, who I'm now working with again many years later, on one of the first personal robots called Psy, which is an educational robot. You can still find many pictures and stories about Psy on the internet. At that time, we had called it Rugrat. I wrote a few proposals for Henry that successfully both brought him back to Pittsburgh and then grew uh, this company, which later led to two other companies, including uh, Atheon and now Four Moms. Uh, Kasergica, together with uh, Dr. Tony DeGioia um, and a great, really great uh, group of friends, uh, Fritz Morgan, Dave Simon, Branko Yaramez, Bob O'Toole, all of whom have gone on to do other great things because every one of these failed miserably. <laughs> so, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you why this one failed, right? We were looking at changing a keyboard format from standard QWERTY to Dvorak because if you spend enough time with Dvorak, you can actually type much faster. And I thought, that, oh, that was, that's great, that's really cool. And uh, Mike actually wrote the code, we replaced the ROM, we put an ad in a magazine, and we sold one. <laughs> because we had no idea who the customer was. We had no idea what the market was. And we thought, well, we're geeks, there's a lot of others uh, of us out there, I hope. And uh, we tried marketing this. So we ended up writing, creating an instruction manual, doing packaging, all for this one guy who had bought the thing. And we never heard from the guy again, so hopefully it went well. <laughs> um, here in robotics, and I know Howard will remember all the Zenith terminals that we had in robotics, we bought hundreds of them, and uh, that was sort of the de facto uh, terminal to all the uh, mainframes at the time that we were using. Um, and then uh, this failed just because we didn't understand what the real application was. Uh, here's a fun robot, education. People who have uh, Apple computers will love to use this because it's a cool robot. No, it failed too because we didn't really understand what the customer was. Because Surgica was an outgrowth of the work that still goes on in uh, medical robotics and the computer assisted surgery uh, group here um, at Carnegie Mellon, and basically taking uh, femoral implants and the acetabular cups for hip surgery and being able to uh, guide the surgeon in a way that's more efficient and a better uh, location than with the way they can do it surgically now. It involved preoperative planning, it involved a number of other things. What we didn't understand was the business, and we also didn't understand what it took to bring a FDA regulated product to market. If it's a class three medical device, we're talking about a completely different animal from a standard hardware company or a standard product company. Um, the other aspect too, and, and in general today, I'm talking not just about software startups, which have a wonderful advantage of having zero marginal cost and being able to, you know, the second copy doesn't cost any more than the first copy, the third copy. You can ship a million copies of something and to create that and distribute that really costs you very, very little. So the marginal cost of incrementing that um, is almost zero. But we're talking about companies that actually build hardware, ship it, make it, deliver it, and support it. It's a very different story in that case. Uh, Kasergica, I think, failed because we didn't understand the business environment. Uh, working with Tony was great. He's a fantastic surgeon. I would definitely use him if I ever had to uh, have a, uh, a, pr a procedure that required a hip implant. His dislocation rate is extraordinarily low, and he does a lot of these procedures per year. But what we didn't understand as a group was what it took to license the technology and build a business around it. Uh, so it actually petered along for a few years, but all of it, most of us have gone on to other things. But some of the folks here went on to Bluebell Technologies, which is a very successful startup here in Pittsburgh. Um, it's a medical uh, device uh, that has been successfully tested and is now being marketed. Uh, Dave Simon is now CTO at Sophomore Danik. Uh, Fritz Morgan is working with Dean Kamen on a variety of things. And Bob O'Toole is a uh, highly rated, highly ranked uh, orthopedic surgeon down in Baltimore doing a lot of trauma and uh, other things. I spent a lot of time here. <laughs> I was here as an undergraduate, here as a, as a staff engineer, a scientist, and PhD student. Um, and then during that era, uh, I, I built a lot of robots with uh, Art Sanderson. The picture, it looks like I'm about 14 there, but I'm actually a freshman or a sophomore in college at the time with one of the very first robots in the Institute. And then with Hans Moravec building uh, Pluto and Neptune and Uranus, with one with the uh, funny omnidirectional wheels. And then with Red Whitaker for many years, uh, building out uh, other robots, uh, the NAV lab, the first of the big autonomous vehicles, uh, later the space shuttle robot for Kennedy Space Center, and then the Ambler, which uh, together with uh, John Bears and Penny Pengels, Dave Wettergreen, and many others here, uh, we made a very successful walking machine that combined many of the things we do so well here at Carnegie Mellon, which is to build integrated systems. 
Um, I did my PhD, finished it, and then left. And midway through my PhD, I realized I didn't want to stay in academia. I wanted to actually make products for people. Uh, it's a little bit different from uh, teaching, which is also very rewarding. But uh, I really wanted to build things that matter to, uh, to other people directly. And uh, so I spent a lot of time on that. The other thing I would suggest, um, and you know, everybody's time is filled, but when, one of the things I did, well, as a, both as a staff member and as a student, was do some consulting, and I, it was very rewarding, not from a monetary point of view, it actually wasn't uh, all that great for that, but it was really rewarding because I got a chance to see folks in the real world and what they were doing, what they were building, how they were doing it, and did two projects with Apple. One was to help automate the assembly of the early Macs right on the assembly line at a factory that they had at that time in Fremont. Of course, there's no factory in Fremont anymore. Uh, worked with uh, Hagen Schempf on a project with uh, Cadelco, which is the national mining company of Chile, to automate ore processing and increase the uh, economics uh, therein. With Caterpillar for some uh, positioning systems, and three or four others. It was just a really valuable experience. Most of these were relatively short-term projects. The Apple one went over two years, uh, again with uh, a couple of folks here. The most rewarding part about that for me personally was getting the latest laptops and uh, being able to uh, do some fun things with them. Uh, we did some things with temperature monitoring and the early power dose. Um, we had worked together with uh, another graduate, uh, Steve Young, who was at that time running some of the laptop programs at Apple. So these were both a lot of fun and very instructive. I learned a lot about how the company's working, how they evaluated things. Cadelco never implemented what we did, Caterpillar did, Apple did. Uh, and so it was sort of hit and miss in terms of uh, the work we did and the success if you would judge it by adopting what we had created. Um, but that, that sort of activity was very, very useful. And I want to point out um, that CMU's advantages, at least at that time, and I'm trying to get a better picture of, of today, was around systems thinking. Right? And robotics is a system. You're, you're combining mechanics and electronics, optics, software, embedded firmware, and so forth all into a fully integrated system. And that systems thinking permeates this place. In fact, it permeated places before um, the Robotics Institute in many ways. The computer science department was already building big systems like CMSTAR and C.NMP, huge multiprocessor architectures that no one else had been doing at the time. And only companies like IBM, for example, or DEC could even think about doing that. But they were funding CMU at the time to build them. And so where people were coming here from MIT or Stanford or Caltech and other places, they were remarked on not a couple of things. One was we had full-time staff to help provide continuity to build things, support things, but also that we built big systems. And that sort of bold vision and direction was really uh, a big uh, impetus to making great things here at, at Carnegie Mellon. Technology integration, building at scale, you know, it's not laboratory, it's not uh, tabletop systems. These were large vehicles that ran at highway speeds by the time we got to the NavLab 6. And so, it was a huge advantage having the shop facilities, having people who knew how to run them uh, was a, a great advantage. And we were able to build systems with systems that, like the Ambler, which stood four meters tall or more when it was fully in a full stance. Um, you know, being able to do that kind of thing. And it doesn't necessarily, I'm not talking about big iron specifically, but the ability to uh, build systems that are great in scope, uh, that have uh, a bold vision in terms of what they can do. It was a huge advantage. I hope that still exists today. I'd like to learn more about it. So when I finished my degree and left, I, I looked around the country and looked at a few different options. I ended up joining a mid-sized company in the Boston area called PRI Automation. And they were the leader at that point in semiconductor automation, meaning the robots that handle wafers and the fabs where all the chips are made. And it had to be ultra clean. It had to be ultra reliable because companies like Intel that ran the fabs would not stand for anything that was less than a 99.99% uptime. And so you learned about reliability, you learned about cleanliness, you learned about what it took to make these, these products. The business model, though, is sort of interesting because it was uh, low volume, high margin products, high cost products. Uh, so you weren't making thousands or hundreds of thousands of these things. You were making maybe dozens of these things, maybe hundreds in a few cases. But the these devices, and this is one that I work on called the Hoist, which is a, a robotic device that lowers on ribbons, and then it's able to uh, place the wafer pod into a, what's called a front opening uh, area of, a, uh, of some of these devices, which, which is where the wafers were actually processed. And it was exciting. Um, a couple of things I found out, though, after, after being hired, I was allegedly able to be heading up some R&D activities and 
developing a team, and I was really hired as a sort of mercenary to uh, go after problems that they were facing at the time and also to fend off other groups within the company. Um, I really enjoyed the time there. I still have many friends from that era, but I only spent a couple of years there. And then a really interesting opportunity came along, and thanks to some CMU alums, uh, I was able to join a small company in Boston which had relocated from Pittsburgh <coughs> at the time. And so it's sort of instructive to look at why this company and other companies have re relocated from Pittsburgh. And at that time, it had to do a lot with the financing. It had a lot to do with the infrastructure in Pittsburgh to support small companies, such as marketing, legal assistance, the finance, not just financing, which is the money coming in, but also uh, the advice that you can get. And Boston and Silicon Valley uh, were, were the places to go at that time. So Color Kinetics, which really did begin right here on Craig Street, uh, ended up moving to Boston relatively soon. So while this had happened, I was working at PRI and I met with uh, the CEO, George, of Color Kinetics. And I was completely taken by what Color Kinetics was doing, which was taking an entirely new light source called LEDs. I'm, I'm speaking in, the, in terms of the late 1990s because LEDs at that time were not thought of for lighting. If you're an electrical engineer, you probably knew about them. Little light source, semiconductor based, not very efficient, mostly available in red. And, uh, and today, as you know, uh, years later, that's come to pass to be now uh, suitable for mainstream lighting. Probably not in this room right now, but uh, soon coming to a room near you. Uh, so what's happened, what I joined in early 1999 in color kinetics was just using red, green, and blue LEDs at the time. And the insight, and I didn't have this, this was uh, George and Ehor, who were the co-founders. The insight that they had was the blue LEDs, which was the missing ingredient, had just come out. And Suji Nakamura of Japan had created the blue LED, and a high brightness blue LED it was not that efficient, but you could see a fair amount of light from it. And it was equal in brilliance in terms of light output as the red and greens that were available at the time. They still cost a lot. At that time, this is the oldest picture shown in the, uh, in the slide here in the uh, upper right. Uh, the blue LEDs were on the order of $5 a piece at the time. And you had uh, a light assembly of maybe a few hundred LEDs, one third of which was each color. That was pretty damn expensive. And in fact, this fixture retailed for around $1,500, almost entirely due to the cost of the LEDs, since the rest of it was an aluminum extrusion and a print circuit board. But what we recognized, and what the lighting companies did not, was what was happening in LEDs was the same thing happening in computing, something akin to Moore's Law, in lighting, it's termed differently. It's called Heitz's Law. But it's the number of lumens per watt and the cost of these LEDs that was coming down so rapidly. And as a result, over, over a few years, we could begin to see that, uh, that rapid and downward slope of the cost and the improvements in the efficiency of the devices. And we could see that within 10 years, that these were, these were going to match or exceed what we could do with uh, traditional light sources. And so Color Kinetics ended up being the first company to recognize this and promote uh, lighting using uh, LEDs. And of course the white LED came along, which is essentially just a blue LED with a phosphor coating to do down conversion of that light. Color Kinetics grew not because of the lighting industry. In fact, the way we positioned ourselves was as an effects company, because there's no way we could compete with mainstream lighting. It would have been insane to do that. And Philips, Osram, uh, GE, who were the biggest, three biggest lighting companies in the world, would have, would have just crunched us. I mean, they would have just taken us out. So as a result, what we did was continue to develop the technology. We really understood how to build with LEDs. It's a lot more subtle than you might think. Uh, it's not as easy as you might think. Um, and then we also built controllers. Even though at one point our CTO, you already said, uh, we'll never build controllers. We're just going to build lights, and we'll use theater controllers to control all the lighting. Well, customers were looking for something a lot more than that. So we ended up developing what is essentially an iPod for lights that stores shows. Each light is on a network address. You can control it so you can create these effects which ripple colors and light uh, down. Um, we built uh, user interfaces, nonlinear programming software. We actually uh, used two interns from Carnegie Mellon at the time who uh, created the first version of that software. We ripped it up, threw it away, and built it again. Uh, and uh, that became uh, our iPlayer software. The team was, was great, so I actually stayed longer than any of the folks in this photo. One thing you'll see in startups is that people do leave over time. It's not as stable as you might hope or think for various reasons. Uh, but I learned a huge amount. That was my MBA. It's, I don't have an actual MBA degree, but if I look at what I learned in business when I was in polygenetics, it's equivalent to that. Um, 
Kathy Patterson headed up marketing, taught me a great deal. She was uh, experienced from Apple, Quark, and several other high-tech companies. And I learned a lot about that and to share some of that with you as well. <coughs> and then some of the projects. We did projects all over the world, and Philips Color Kinetics continues to do that. We went public in 04. We were acquired by Philips in 07 for around 800 million. And because they saw it, this also changed in the lighting industry. And I'm very interesting to look at the effect on Philips, because the lighting industry is a GMP growth company. It doesn't grow much faster than the economy. Um, in fact, now it's probably decreasing uh, at that rate. Um, but in 2013, uh, Color Kinetics, which was only at about 80 to $100 million a year run rate, um, accounted for less than 1% of the revenues for Philips, but 22% of the profits for the entire lighting company, for the entire lighting division. And so that's continued to increase. We're about 25% of all Philips businesses now, uh, lighting businesses now in uh, LEDs. So a pretty tremendous growth rate, and that continues to grow. Um, I left in uh, 2010. Um, I stayed on actually after the acquisition for, a, it was a two-year lockup, and then some other time I had to spend um, that I wanted to spend actually working with the groups in Washington. So my role became more of an outward facing role, uh, talking to audiences, working with customers, doing projects, and doing some stuff on the inside. And I learned a lot by doing that as well. I learned a lot about what, how civics works, the civics lesson I never had. Going to Washington, so the EPAC legislation that came out in 2007, uh, the Phillips folks in Washington had brought me in to see Senate staffers and other folks there. And we were able to actually change language and introduce um, a bill, which was called the EPAC legislation, signed by Bush in 2007, to, to essentially uh, move the incandescent lamp out of the stores, which is already happening. 100 watts gone, 75 watts gone, 60 watts next. And what's the, what that is doing is forcing people to buy more energy efficient lamps. And does a pretty good business for Philips in the meantime. I left uh, Philips um, after uh, quite a few years at Color Kinetics and Philips. I was looking for something new. I wanted to think about something. There are some things that don't happen as nicely in, in uh, big companies as they do in small companies. You can't make decisions quickly. There's a lot of consensus building. There's a lot of working with other folks. There's a lot of siloing. I was actually on a line in uh, Shanghai uh, with the team. We are introducing a super efficient lamp that we had done under uh, some DOE funding. And uh, we were told that we don't sell lamps, uh, and, and they shut the line down. It was a different group that sold lamps, not us. And after some other things, I, I decided uh, to move on. I joined a small company called MC10, which is based on the work of John Rogers at the University of Illinois. He's done some amazing work, uh, really far-reaching work in wearable electronics, ultra-thin devices that can be used inside the body or on, on the body. Uh, Rogers and his group at UIC have been able to do uh, amazing things by thinning silicon or making very ultra-thin <coughs> devices just a few microns thick and then deploying them in a wide variety of applications. MC10 was built around that. We actually launched a product with Reebok, to, which is related to the issue of uh, impacts to the head and concussions. Uh, so it uses a very thin, uh, very, very thin uh, sensing packages and sensing devices on very thin flex circuits in order to uh, go on the head. It's worn actually in a skull cap that goes below your helmet. So it doesn't actually measure the impact of the helmet, it measures the impact of the head. And so we launched that as well for a variety of reasons. Uh, I left uh, in January of this year actually and, uh, and then went on to this company, which makes some interesting things. So I'm going to show you one. So this is a, a stroller, and I will talk about the uh, pieces in there. So, okay, I can go through the whole feature set. Daytime running lights, which you can control, cup holders. You can charge your cell phone. It has chargers on it. Brake locks both sides. Uh, it tells you temperature, speed, and odometry, so it gives you distance as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it... It has a processor in it, right? It has actuators in it. It has a display, user interface. Uh, it has a wide variety of things. What, what is different about this from a robot? And what is different about this from things that you're doing in your labs every day? Not much. I mean, you're able to do, and you're writing software. There's embedded firmware in this device that runs it as well. So for all, all, all intents and purposes, this is a robot. But what makes this possible is the same thing that made Color Kinetics possible. It's the rapid, uh, improvement in technology that allows us to do things in a very cost-effective manner. 
So the processors are down to under a dollar a piece. The sensors are pennies. The uh, LCD displays are down to a buck fifty or less in volume. So you start to add these things up, and they don't add much cost, but they add a lot of value. So the whole point is taking technology to add value to these systems, and not simply uh, adding it uh, because you can. Um, you know, we've seen good success, and I would say these products up in the upper left, which are also motion systems, they move in, uh, this one on the left moves an XY, but it, it moves a baby just as a mother bounces and sways with the baby. Uh, we just announced a new version two weeks ago that has uh, smartphone capabilities so you can both control and monitor it and see what's going on. The very interesting thing is that this sort of data, and by the way, that feature was not something we had come up with. That was a feature that parents were asking for. So what was happening is that the babies were stirring and they wanted to change the mode on it, but if they came up, the baby would see them get really excited and want to be taken out. So we wanted a way of doing a remote. So otherwise, the parents were doing army crawls and reaching around behind. Uh, so it became a little uh, uh, problematic when they wanted to do that. But the Bluetooth capability is adding some really interesting features, and you're able to do some things with data collection. We're doing some field trials. And uh, you can see some interesting uh, behaviors. The Rockaroo uh, is a swing that works much like a rocking horse swing, a very simple, low-cost mechanism. And then the Breeze, this is a purely mechanical system, so it's not all electronics, it's not all uh, smartphone technology. The case of the Breeze, most of the play yards that are used for infant children or small, small children uh, are very complex. You have to hold up pieces while you're pushing down on another. It takes two, maybe three arms to do it sometimes. Uh, this does it with the press of a single finger. You push down in the middle and the entire linkage locks. Henry, who came up with the whole mechanism, describes it as a 72-bar linkage. It's very <coughs> complex. And then the question is, with startups, and, and Color Kinetics was a great example too, how do you make these things so you can make them in volume? How do you design them? So, one story, September 30th, 1999, and the reason that date's important is because it's the end of the third quarter of the year. We needed to show an uptick in revenues because that's the way you can evaluate. That's how your valuation is sometimes determined for the next round of funding. Uh, but we, did, we hadn't reached that yet and because our CM, our contract manufacturer, who's based in Massachusetts, was falling down on the job. They weren't able to do it. So I took the entire engineering team, which was probably about 13 or 14 of us at the time, out to the CM, 6 in the morning to midnight, the full day, we built our own fixtures, and we realized how crappy the design was. <laughs> our own product. And so we reinvented the product. It turned out to be a blessing in disguise. Not only did we make the revenue number we needed to by getting the devices packaged and out of the loading dock by midnight, but we realized we had to redesign this for assembly. And so design for assembly, or DFM as it's termed, is something that's critically important both to reduce the labor cost in terms of putting the system together, but also making the design much uh, easier to support and much more reliable as well. And for systems like this, you have to do the same thing. These are complex electromechanical systems. And that assembly and that design is critically important to making these things succeed. Um, so for all of these products, and there's many more in the pipeline right now, I have a team of around 40 uh, engineers that are now developing new products. We need to launch those. But it is not as simple as getting something to work on the lab bench. It's much more complex than that. You can't say, you know, I have this thing, it works, ship it. Because you have to do a lot. That only begins the work. When you have plastic parts, now you have to go to tooling. Tooling takes hard tool steels, cuts them up, and they're used for plastic molding. And that takes usually eight to 10 weeks to build once you've figured out what you need for tooling. Because you can't simply design the part you want. You actually have to design it to be molded. That means draft angles, bosses, locations, wall thicknesses, all of that has to be taken into account. Then and only then can you start cutting the tool steel to make the tooling that, will make, that forms the molds to make the plastic parts for that. And that stretches out over months by the time you're, you finish doing that. So these systems tend to get fairly complex, um, and there's a lot to them. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of these, these issues, especially related, related to manufacturing, supply chain, logistics, and so forth. The other thing I did, and this is sort of related to the consulting point I made earlier, I find it really interesting to be uh, on advisory boards and boards because you get to see a different context. Um, I was on the board of a company that actually did a wind down. They, in the end, they failed because of some issues they had with some of the customers. Um, and I was on the audit committee. I asked the CEO, why the heck do you want me on the audit committee? I'm not a finance guy. And he said, well, you ask lots of questions. <laughs> and he thought that was good. 
So I was asking questions about financial controls. How do you make sure that uh, things don't go awry or, or that an employee is not put in a position that could end up uh, embarrassing the company in some way? And when investors and auditors come in, they look for those kinds of things. So I was just asking questions about that. And so suddenly I got in the auto. Nonprofit boards, nonprofits operate in a very different way. Um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and the people in nonprofits generally are very passionate about what they do. They love what they're doing. They're, they're on a mission. Uh, but often they don't have a lot of business experience and business uh, skills to bring to that. But they clearly have the passion, which probably matters more than the other things. And then I've been involved in uh, advisory boards in CMU for some time, including now the SES board. So I don't know if Anna Karenina is a very famous Russian novel by Tolstoy. And it's first sentence. Does anybody know what the first sentence of that novel is? It's one of the most famous in literature. All happy families you see. Yes. All unhappy families are unhappy in a different way. So uh, it's one of the most famous lines in literature. And the reason that, that there is now something called the Anna Karenina principle. And the principle has been applied to things like looking at species, the domest domestication of species. And basically, it says that all these, other, all these things have to go right in order for this to happen. So if they think about it, instead of happy families and unhappy families, successful startups and unsuccessful startups. To be successful, they're sort of all the same because they're doing everything right. They're doing marketing right. They're doing finance right. They're doing, they got the technology right. But how many ways can a company fail? Many, many ways. And so the Anacronina principle can be applied to this. Um, I've heard it certainly used in biology and ecology and other uh, disciplines. But in this case, if you look at um, startups, how many things can go wrong? And it's not about technology. We're not just about technology. Technology is only part of that. So I what I want to do is, is go through a few different things uh, about different roles in a company and how they're, how they're typically run and what the responsibilities are. What I want you to clearly notice, though, is technology is only one small component of a company, only one small component of a successful company. And you know that sometimes you, you think about the startups, the two guys in a garage, they start something that's all about technology, but as they grow, as they scale, um, as they make things, uh, there's a lot of other factors that come into play. So the executive role in a company, and, and if you're looking at a startup, if you're looking to make a startup, who's going to run it? Who's going to articulate the vision of the company? Who's going to drive that? Who's going to motivate the employees? So all of that has to happen. Um, you need, you know, your CEO should be your number one cheerleader. He's, he's, he or she is the person who actually makes the company. Uh, tells the story to the street, tells the story to investors, tells the story to the board, and tells the story to the employees so that they're all on the same page. Uh, they also they make decisions and direct execution. It's very rare to find someone who's actually is still hands-on and an individual contributor, except in a very, very small startup. And what investors often look for is when they look at startups, they want to make sure, because it's very rare to have say a Zuckerberg or Jobs, who were both the founders and then stay a CEO as that company grows. That's extraordinarily rare. It doesn't mean it can't happen. It could. One of you could be that person. But it really, it, it's a very different skill set. As the company grows and scales, you need to understand them. On the sales side, it's all about, uh, you know, every company is selling something, whether it's to another business, uh, whether it's to individual consumers, whether it's to the retail customers. At Four Moms, we're actually selling to the retailers and then getting to the customers. So Target, Bye Bye Baby, or Babies Are Us, all of that, those are true big customers. We have lots of other small, smaller customers and some direct. But the sales group is the one that drives that relationship. And if they don't have that relationship, you can't get the sale. And you can't get the money in. Sales folks, for that reason, are usually the highest paid people in the company, not the technical people. And the reason is because they're generating revenue technical people are cost centers. Sorry. <laughs> I'm on the cost side. I don't generate revenue directly for the company. Uh, and they're revenue and quota driven. They're very driven. These are, these are people who are probably not in this room. <laughs> Almost certainly. It's a very different, uh, it's a very type A, outgoing, extroverted tech, uh, personality. Um, it's someone who uh, doesn't take no for an answer, puts their foot in the door. Uh, there's a lot going on with a really good salesperson and how they do that. You could be very strategic, you could be very smart, and the best sales folks are, but there's a, there's a lot to it. They're also the front line of the company. They're out there uh, every day uh, hitting the pavement and, and trying to drive more sales. 
They're also responsible for the forecasts. You know, that curve up into the right that all the investors want to see and all the consultants say that you can do, they're the ones who actually have to generate that. And the other thing is, uh, I didn't know this as a grad student, you know, what's the difference between sales and marketing? They sort of seem to be the same, but they're not. Marketing is really the, in, the interface between inside the company and outside the company. And they do a lot, a lot of work. They listen to the customers, they define the product. In fact, marketing is often one of the most interesting parts for a technical company. I know a lot of technical people have gone into marketing because they understand the technology, they can communicate it well, and they're able to position the company, position the brand, position the product, and they really understand that. Technical people actually make, for at least the high tech industry, make very good marketers. Um, there's a lot of tactics involved, brand, messaging, corpcom, marcom, and so forth, uh, advertising, web presence, social media. Um, little four moms, which is very small compared to our competitors in the business, uh, has the largest social media presence of any company in our segment. And that's because we made a concerted effort to do that, and we knew the other larger companies in that just didn't understand that. They weren't part of that. They didn't grow up with that. And uh, that's made a big difference for us. They also do a forecast with sales, they identify the markets and all the communications things that I mentioned, mentioned as well as collateral materials, which are the substance of, uh, uh, that people use and often make decisions about, uh, about whether or not to buy a product. So HR is sort of a, it's an area of a company that isn't given as much attention as it should, but the most important thing you can do in a startup is hire the right people. And if you're not doing that, uh, you're, you're poisoning the well. The chemistry of each individual coming aboard, you don't do it just because they have the right words on a resume. Uh, you do it because they're a, a great fit, uh, that they can add value, and they're enthusiastic and passionate about what you're doing. And if they have the skill set too, that's, that's a huge bonus. But I'll take people who don't have all the experience I would like to have and do better with that than it will with somebody on paper who doesn't have some of the other qualities I'm looking for. And so a colleague of mine um, sort of created this uh, shorthand for evaluating people. When I interview, I often think about these. Do they have a clue? Do they know what they're doing? Do they have the right skill set? Do they have the education that you have here um, in knowing uh, what it is you have to do? Do they play well with others? If they don't, I don't want them on the team. I've actually had to let people go because they just didn't uh, work well with uh, other, other people. They were antisocial, not just a little bit social. Um, and they give a damn. They really are passionate about what it is you're trying to do. Um, you can see it at Google when you go and visit. You can see it at Facebook when you go and visit. People are passionate. They're doing something. They're doing something great. And even the companies I've been involved with, we try to hire people who really feel as passionate as we do about that. And they get things done. There's plenty of great, smart people out there who can talk a good game, but in the end don't get a lot done. Um, we want people who have a great track record for that. This is the, the no jerks rule. Is uh, Actually, I, I made it more polite than it was, but uh, um, uh, this was actually a, a friend of mine at Google, uh, who runs Google X, who said, uh, yeah, we have a no, no assholes rule. And, uh, and they look for that. They do cultural interviews. They have people who are not part of the technical team that we're working directly with them to sort of look at people and try to understand what they're like. They're really full of themselves. Who, who wants that in, the, in their work environment? And then the road test. A friend of mine is a senior exec at Verizon, and they have this pretty simple test, which is how far would you drive in a car with a candidate? And one mile, kick them out, or a thousand miles? And he told me a story about a, a woman who had come in who just had a fascinating life story, and uh, he knew that she would work well. And they, when they got back together at the end of the day to debrief from the candidate, everybody said they'd drive on the other side of the country with her. And so that became a very simple rule, a very effective way to uh, judge someone. Um, there's lots of things you can do with the HR thing. You can do the, the puzzles that Microsoft and Google are, are famous for. But they found that those are not really good indicators of how well people work in the teams, how well and how effective they'll be in projects and so forth. So engineering, the technical side of the company, is responsible for implementation. You have to make the thing and you have to make it work. And that's often very challenging. If you're doing a startup, you're doing something not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And that implementation um, takes the form of taking something from a concept to a prototype to a production-worthy prototype. And that's you know, quite a bit of work depending on the kinds of things you're doing. Uh, designing prototyping, prototyping, DFM, there's a lot of sustaining engineering, product life, product life cycle management, and other things that have to be done. Document control, if you're in medical, there's a whole thing with documentation that has to be done, and a quality management system has to be put in place. These, 
these are not easy things and they're often expensive things to put in place but they're necessary and technology development and the other thing I want to emphasize is that when you're doing a startup and you're thinking about the customer not about the technology of the product it's the product that defines the technology not the other way around too many companies have not done all that well because they focused on the technology and said, oh, we're putting it out there, we built the better technology, but without a compelling instance of that technology in a particular market, it's, uh, they, they probably won't do all that well. Manufacturing is something um, I grew pretty fascinated with. I've been in China many, many times, um, mostly South China, Hong Kong, uh, Shanghai, um, and you know, that's where most many of the world's products are now built, especially electronics projects, products. And it's fascinating to see it. And the, the basic model is go from vertically integrated companies, the canonical example is Henry Ford, who owned rubber plantations in South America, who owned iron mines in, in Minnesota, and would bring all this stuff together in Detroit and build cars. Um, nobody does that anymore. Uh, there are still a few pretty vertically integrated companies. Caterpillar comes to mind. They make just about everything except wheels. Um, but the vertical integration model has gone away, and people are outsourcing manufacturing, logistics. You can outsource marketing. You can outsource a lot of things. The advantage for a startup is you can scale as you need to. You can outsource many of these things, especially for a hardware-based company. But also, this is where money is made and lost. If you can't get your line up on time, if you can't build that product to a, a requisite uh, quality standard, you can lose a lot of money and just burn money uh, while you wait. Um, it also involves procurement, how do you get stuff inexpensively, how do you negotiate. Uh, you know, there's a lot of sensitive negotiations that go around, on around manufacturing. Managing inventory, you build too many things, it sits there for a year. It, it's devalued. It's, it's actually money that's just going away because the value that goes, goes down pretty dramatically, especially in high technology. Assembly, integration, testing, quality, certification. Compliance and regulatory for many different markets are a huge hurdle. Uh, when we did our first LED lights, underwriters' laboratories had no idea what we had. They, they'd never seen anything like it before. How do you certify a light with a whole new technology? It's not incandescent. It's not fluorescent. It's not mercury discharge. It's not a metal halide. So they didn't know where to fit us. And it took several years of wrangling to sort of get us to a point where we could do that. Uh, there were no standards around LED lights and how do you judge the amount of light coming out from it. It's no longer about wattage, it's about lumens. And you're starting to see that in different packages. Uh, when you buy lamp, light bulbs or lamps these days, you'll see a little thing that looks like the uh, food chart in the back of uh, most food, but instead of calories, it's about lumens. <coughs> and so that whole thing had to happen over several years in order to make the industry viable. And manufacturing in general, as it should be, is very conservative. Um, because you don't want to experiment on, uh, on manufacturing too much. Another area of the company that is very important is just, just raising money. And I'll talk a little bit more about VCs and, and raising money. But finance is actually different. From it's about not simply sort of keeping the books, which is the accounting. It's about managing cash flow. It's about knowing what your balance sheet looks like. And there's a lot here that has to be done in order to manage a company. When I joined Color Kinetics, after the two co-founders, the first hire wasn't sales, marketing, or, or myself as a head of engineering. Uh, it was actually our CFO, uh, Dave Johnson. And the reason for that was a small amount of money come in. They wanted to manage that well. And it was smart. One of the reasons I joined the company was because they had hired a CFO, a head of sales and marketing, uh, two heads, one of sales and one of marketing, uh, then engineering. So it wasn't like the typical sort of technical spin-off, which was just a bunch of engineers trying to build something cool. Um, it was really about managing uh, what customers wanted and what we needed to build and how to sell it, as well as then how to build it. So it was a, a big lesson. Uh, for finance, there are accounts, receivables, payables, and these are good things to have. Uh, you, want to, you want to be buying uh, parts, you want to be selling products, and these are good things to have in place. How you do revenue recognition, you know, when can you recognize revenue? None of this is cut and dry. So even though there is a gap, a generally accepted accounting standards and so forth, uh, there's a lot you can do um, with how you manage your finances. Uh, SEC issues, if you think about going public or dealing with uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, these are all things you have to deal with. Um, that's a good thing to deal with if you're going public. But the way we always operated um, as a company, and this has been through several companies, you operate as though you're going public. Operate as though you're going to have an exit, that you might be acquired. 
if you do that, then you're open and transparent about it. When investors come in, they do their due diligence. It becomes that much easier for them to say, yeah, I'm going to invest in you because we'll figure this out. And so having that financial part of it is really and, and that involves lots of audits and a lot of money to do that. So where do you raise money from? Well, if you're fortunate enough, maybe you have some money, you can do it, or you can live on peanut butter sandwiches for a few months and work out of a dorm room. Uh, that happens. Uh, a friend, Manu Kumar, uh, who runs Canine Ventures in the Valley, funds only uh, projects that are companies that were started by students in the dorm rooms. He has a very neat niche in the Valley. He essentially becomes the farm team for the bigger VCs in the Valley, once in Sand Hill Road and so forth. He's been very successful at doing that. But the sources of the money can range from your, your pocket, friends, family, uh, people who just, just will invest, uh, institutional investors, private equity. Um, there's a lot of ways to finance a company. You can also do equity financing as well as debt financing. Um, and customers. At one point, Color Kinetics was uh, just about to run out of money. This is part of that roller coaster I was telling you about. It sounded very successful as a company who took the long-term view. But in any month, any quarter, uh, there were a lot of issues. And at one point, we nearly ran out of money for payroll. We were within 24 hours, and we had an investment from a large customer of ours who said, boy, you, you're driving a great business. It's steady. It's growing. Because prior to that, the big business in LEDs were the big video screens, the scoreboards. But those were intermittent. They were spiky. So you might have a scoreboard in January and another one to build in May. But it wasn't steady growing business. So they liked what we were doing because it was steady and growing. So that customer invested in us and they made a lot of money after that investment. Um, but that was one way to finance the company and keep moving forward. Uh, I mentioned due diligence already. It takes a lot of time. When you do a roadshow, it takes a lot of time. This is not something you can just say, oh, this will take care of itself or we'll send out a few emails. Um, and then the pitch to raise money must be great. A good friend of mine. Uh, Brian Schemmel, who uh, was at Color Kinetics, uh, he was here. In fact, Matt, I know you know met Brian from when he was in high school here. Um, he started another company after leaving Color Kinetics. A number of people started other LED companies. So the diaspora of Color Kinetics went on to found about probably another six or so companies. But he had seven pitches to VCs before he got the funding. 107 times he repeated this pitch. He traveled sat in front of the investors, told them the story, pitched the story again and again and again and again. He said never again, but <laughs> he, uh, uh, he was able to do that. He was able to then hire a CEO who was able to take over a lot of that, while Brian was able to focus on the technology, which is where, where, what he loves. So it's, the pitch has to be great in order to raise funding, but there's no guarantee that anyone will want it. Uh, and then equity. You know, when you join a startup, one of the great benefits potentially is if you get a small share of that company, you become an owner, you share in the success of that company. But how much should you get? What does the cap table look like, which is a list of investors and how much they own? Well, you probably won't get the full cap table. You'll probably get, okay, our investors are this much, but the employees own this much, the founders own this much. And in some cases, like Google and Facebook, the founders actually own a substantial portion, maybe even a controlling interest still. But uh, for, many, for many startups, that isn't the case. And so what, what do you look for in doing that? What are the total number of shares? What's the current market valuation per share? What percentage am I getting? It's usually well below 1%, uh, even for early, some early employees. So you just have to understand the dynamics of that. It might seem unfair, but that's really what it is, because the investors are looking for a 10 times payback, and most of their investments fail. It's worse than a baseball player. Right? If you hit 300 baseball, you're doing really well. VCs don't even see that. They might see one out of ten really succeed, and sometimes that's that's pretty good. That's why they're looking for a ten times return. And then dilution. And one of the things I've been very glad to hear is that Carnegie Mellon's tech transfer policy has changed since I left. One of the things that what I did with Casergica that I mentioned early on was went to the head of the uh, tech transfer office here at CMU and asked him what it took, what were the terms and conditions of doing a startup. He said, well, we want uh, non-dilutive equity, we want a board seat, we want right of first refusal, uh, and went on to, you know, I lost, lost interest after that. <laughs> because no investor on the outside ever invested a company with that much onerous uh, stakes or uh, onerous conditions around that. But fortunately, in the last, I guess probably it was close to 10 years ago, uh, Jerry Cohen uh, led an initiative and drove the transfer office. It's now 5% go in peace. That's much more attractive. And I think it's non-dilutive up until the uh, first uh, financing event. I don't know if that's right. 
Howard and Matt may know, but the, uh, the the upshot is it's more to do startups, and it's been a very successful program because the number of startups coming coming out of Carnegie Mellon are now uh, phenomenal. And we're seeing a lot of great startups coming out. So even those types of terms and conditions for starting a company can uh, you know make you fail or succeed. Um, and having a very warm and comforting support from the university for IP generated here at the university. If you do it outside the university, you don't have to worry about that. But um, I will say that uh, one particular dean, whose name I won't mention, said, well, if you're going to do a company, do it in your mother-in-law's name. Don't tell them. <laughs> That's a bad guy. <laughs> I won't say who it was. And it wasn't anybody in this room. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you operate your company, operate like you have an exit in mind. Operate as though you're going to go public or you're going to get acquired support. That way you're, you have all the right information for the, for the next stage. So when you go to a startup and you sort of you, you expect that you're not going to be paid as well as, as if you went to a big company, but how much and, and what, what does that look like? What does it look like over time as the company grows? So managers are rewarded more highly than technical contributors. And why is that? And it's because generally management is harder than technology. Managing large groups of people, there's lots of things to deal with. And that skill set is actually harder to come by uh, than it is to find great technical people. Surprisingly, it's still really hard to find great technical people. Um, and every, every company here or in the Valley or in Boston are trying to do that as well. And so you have to uh, look, at, look at all of that and understand why this is. Um, technical people, though, will often have the highest starting salaries by far, and that's generally true. But over time, you look at uh, marketing executives and directors. You look at uh, sales executives and directors, and they'll tend to creep up over a 10, 15 year period. Um, and technical people think, well, oh, geez, you know, this is really hard stuff. I'm doing, uh, I'm doing math, I'm doing coding, I'm doing stuff that's really hard technically. But if you look at it overall at a company and how people are rewarded, R&D development is typically only 5 or 10% 5 of revenues. 10% is pretty high, uh, even for a high tech company. So what, what matters to companies and how people are rewarded? So it's accountability for corporate performance and customer satisfaction. That is what really gets rewarded, not purely technical. The technical people can earn a great living and do very, very well. This is all relative. I'm just talking about uh, how people are rewarded in general in the business. Venture capital. This is uh, a lot of people, the, the derisive term, the pejorative term is uh, vulture capital. It's not the case. They're, actually there to make you succeed. They want you to succeed. And a lot of people are fearful of losing control of the company. And that, that can be, but the reason they're investing in you is because of you. It's not because of something else. There are horror stories out there. There are people who invest and have other things in mind. And that's, that's the rarity. You might get some of the publicity within that uh, ecosystem of entrepreneurs and, and VCs. But what they're looking for, they're looking for the management team, they're looking for the track record. You know, they often, they have a saying, which I'm, I'm not sure I believe, but they're often looking for uh, the A team and the B idea, or they of course like the A team and the A idea, but uh, they'd rather have support and invest in the A team and the B idea than the B team and the A idea. And the reason for that is that management that knows their way around can change the direction of the company, they can make uh, decisions quickly, they're very strategic, uh, and so uh, that's, that's one of the main criteria that they look at. Even if they don't understand the idea, they think, oh, this team is good, they've done it before, they know what they're doing, that's why I'm impressed. The tech team, they certainly look at that. They want to see the upside in revenue. They want to see the market opportunity and growth. They want to see some IP protection. How can you protect yourself from somebody stealing your idea and then just doing it? And the IP valuation for companies can be quite high. Um, look, they look for differentiators, what distinguishes you from other, other folks in the market. Are you creating, are you carving out an existing market, or are you creating a whole new market? And they evaluate that in, in different ways. And the due diligence I mentioned before mostly focuses on financials, not on technical. It was sort of disappointing to me, you know, that I attended a number of early board meetings at uh, Color Kinetics and I was ready to show them all the cool technology we were developing. And then, okay, yeah, well, what are the numbers? <laughs> how, how many did you sell this quarter? Uh, why are your freight costs so high? Where are your DSOs this month? It was all about that. It wasn't about the technology itself. Although, we did have show and tells every once in a while. So they provide money. They provide connections. So when you, you, if you feel like you're giving up control, what are you getting in return? And I think the really important part to think about here is that 
you don't want to take dumb money. If somebody just writes you a check and hands it to you, that's actually not of that great of value. What you want is someone who can do all of this, who can help you recruit great people, who can establish connections with people perhaps in the market. Uh, Bain Capital is one of our investors at Four Moms. They have a very strong connection with Toys R Us. That was a, another great factor in accepting your money. Uh, and so, and it's also a cultural thing. You know, are they the right kind of investor for what you want to do? We saw our CEO turn down a multi-million dollar check because it wasn't the right fit, the investor with the company. It's tempting, especially if you're in monetary trouble, to accept that, but you'd rather not if you don't have to long term. Um, they can help uh, with your time to market to accelerate that, make it easy to raise money later, and that's sort of clearly an implicit seal of approval in having a company invest in you because somebody else will look at that and say, well, they did their homework. And there are plenty of VCs out there and investors who will say, boy, if they invested in them, they must be good. Sometimes it's called the lemming theory, but uh, it's uh, still a useful thing to have. It really does uh, provide an endorsement. And so when you look at, if you're starting a company and you're looking at VCs, what do they bring to the table? Do they also have operational experience? Are they just money? Do they know how to run a company? Have they done this before? Uh, you know, Usually when I've interviewed with startups in the past, I ask to talk to their lead investor. I want to find out where their thoughts are and what directions they want to go in. And I re and recognize this, this issue of, of dumb money. Know, know the game or find someone who does because you, just, you, know, you really should understand what all of this means, what pre-valuation, pre post-valuation for each funding round, what happens uh, if things take a downturn. What's going to happen then? They still believe in you. They're still going to support you. Do you end up in the worst of all cases, which you're losing money or not gaining anything, and then you end up with a cram down where somebody comes in later, invests, and everybody's stock moves in early goes down in value as well. It happens a lot more than you think. And valuation is really tricky. How do you value something that's not even on the market? So when Color Kinetics accept the first check for a quarter of a million to start the company, and really get it off the ground, there was no valuation attached to the company because no one knew what the value of the company was. We had no idea. What, like, hey, here's the lighting market. It's really big. We think we can make a splash in it. But we just didn't know. It wasn't until the, the completion of the C round or the A round uh, that uh, we were able to establish any value at all. And then as sales increased and so forth and the margins went up, we could start describing value to the shares. But it took a while. It's actually fairly tricky. And Sometimes in later rounds, you may not want, uh, there's not always an incentive for the VC to have a much higher valuation. If they can get, a, get more of the company at a lower valuation, that's to their advantage. So you just have to watch for things like that. And if you do the job right, if you do things well, things go well, you might have some hiccups along the way, it certainly will. Uh, they'll generally leave you alone, they'll provide the support that you need, and uh, that you might probably want. Um, so what do the VCs look for? I just told you what you should look for. The VCs look for something where they can create a 10 times opportunity for something, where they can invest a million and get 10 back, where they can invest 100 million and get a billion back. They're looking for something like that. And in order to do that, they're evaluating what your technology and what your products and what your markets are. And if it's something that can change, if it changes some, the way things are done by 20 or 30 or 50%, they're probably not interested. Changes by 100%, maybe a few will be interested. When you're talking about something that's 10 times faster, 10 times cheaper, 10 times more effective, then the, you get their attention. But less than that, they're just not interested. It doesn't, it doesn't work financially for them because they're placing a lot of bets and only a few of them succeed. Uh, if you, it's actually a tough place to be as an entrepreneur. You might have to grow it organically yourself over a very long period of time. That's another big thing that VC money can do is accelerate your growth substantially. Um, intellectual property, I briefly touched on, um, patents, trademarks, trade secrets, these are all critical parts of a company. If you look at the Color Kinetics acquisition by Philips, we were only at one-tenth of the revenues of the acquisition price. So where was the rest of the value? Why did they pay that much more for it? Why is Nest acquired for $3 billion? Clearly it wasn't the revenue, because it was nowhere near that. Um, it's, sometimes it's a talent acquisition. Uh, companies, some companies have great teams. Sometimes it's an IP acquisition. Companies want to remain competitive in a certain space. Uh, sometimes they see a strategic opportunity long term. Uh, we don't know in all cases. I, I do know that in the Color Kinetics case that the IP established a very strong portfolio because we were filing like crazy in the early days. 
and uh, we were essentially papering over as much as we could and building a fence around LED lighting, especially smart LED lighting. And so when Philips bought us, they added it to their portfolio, and they made more than that much money off of us, um, off of that price that they paid for us by simply licensing that portfolio to almost everyone else in the market. So there's a lot of opportunities to increase valuation through IP. But you have to be really careful because it's really expensive. Patent lawyers you know, get a fair amount of money. Uh, the filing and prosecution fees, annuities, translation costs, you know, to, go to uh, national jurisdictions elsewhere in the world. So all of that adds up fast. They get CK. I was, I was running the IP group there. It was about 60000 a month back in 2000, 2001. A lot of money especially for a small company. So uh, I'm going to probably skip over a couple of these slides, but uh, even as an employee, potential employee, if you're looking at a startup, evaluate it as though you're an investor. So think about it, you know, you're making an investment of your time and your career at this company. Is it the right fit? Um, do they have good prospects? Do they have the right people? Uh, and what is the real opportunity there? And you have to really think about that and think about the customer and who's buying it. So all of these things go into sort of the analysis and evaluation of that company. It's the same process that the investors are using when they invest in the company. You should be doing the same thing. Does this make sense for me? And it's not always. Is it just cool technology? There's plenty of cool technology out there. People doing really interesting things. But they may not have a market. They may not have any real market value. So that's something to, to look at. Uh, do they also, do they have these other pieces? What are they doing about sales and marketing? If they're not even reaching out to a, a customer, they don't understand who the customer is, it's pretty challenging uh, to sort of think about it. If you're in an enviable position of having enough money to sort of build out a technology and do it for a few years, maybe, but uh, it's hard. VCs sometimes won't, hot, won't, they will not fund platform technologies which can be used in a wide variety of things unless there's a particular business focus or business story around it. And if the growth strategy, if they just tell you, oh, if we just capture 5% of the market, if every person just buys one of these, that's not a, that's not a business plan. It's, that's hope. Um, and will they share when you come into the company? Will they just give you one share, or 100 shares, or any shares at all? You know, that's, that's another sign. Um, and then, of course, for you personally, you know, will you have an impact? Will you learn? Will you have fun? That's, it's really important. Uh, it's, it's no fun being in a company where you're not learning, where you're not having any fun, but you're just working very, very hard, and it's sort of hard to see what, what the outcome is uh, from your heavy work. Um, I'm going to skip over this because I think we're running a little late, but uh, this is uh, just a, a few, if I had to summarize a few things. Understanding your customer is more important than understanding your product. It's really important to find out, to think about the business and who's going to actually be buying the company. And this is, the second one is in Talis because it's something that a, actually a robotics alumni, Ian Davis, uh, started a company in the Boston area. I funded him through uh, some work for Color Kinetics for a while, combining LED lights with video games and a number of other things. It was fascinating and it was a lot of fun. Uh, but Ian introduced me to a gentleman who was the, one of the directors of marketing at Activision, which was one of the big video game publishers at the time. And he said he learned more in two hours with him than he had four years at Activision. <laughs> so I brought that person to Color Kinetics to talk to us about marketing and product marketing specifically. And he had a couple of really interesting things to say, one of which I took to heart, which is the act of creation inhibits evaluation. Don't fall in love with your technology. It may not be a business. It's really hard for technical people, myself included. I've just built this thing. It's really cool. I've spent a lot of time on it. Oh, the algorithms in here are just beautiful. But if nobody wants it, and, and I'm, I'm incapable of evaluating that because I created it. It's really hard to separate yourself from that. And you have to do that. Uh, culture matters a lot. I can't tell you. Uh, if I could print this four or five times, I would. Um, and then, uh, let's see. I, I talked a little bit about compensation, which is commensurate with management, profit responsibility. And here, for many of you, whether you're a master's student or a PhD student, you can be great technical managers. Few become. Uh, great technical marketers or great sales folks. It's just sort of the way we're trained, the way we think, the reason we're here, um, going to school here. Uh, but uh, it is possible. There are certainly examples out there, but just not a lot. So one of the things, uh, a few weeks ago, I was asked to join a roundtable with the, with the mayor of Pittsburgh and a few other entrepreneurs in Pittsburgh. 
regarding startups and some of the advice uh, that we gave the mayor. And he, you know, the nice thing is he's really taking it to heart. So you do have a mayor who gets it, and it's innovation-led. Deborah Lamb, who leads the innovation part of the city of Pittsburgh, is doing a lot to try to connect folks together as well. And I think a lot's going to happen around that. But there's a lot happening here that wasn't here 15 years ago when I left. I've had the privilege of being able to see that snapshot before and after because I knew exactly what it was like when I was left, where there wasn't a lot of the ecosystem required to do, to do startups here in Pittsburgh. But it, a lot of it exists now. It could certainly be a lot better. And the one thing people shouldn't try to do is say, oh yeah, we can compete with Boston or the Valley. You can't. But you can be Pittsburgh and cost of living, the environment here, the technical infrastructure. I can get people. I don't have to compete with them as much as I, I would in the Valley or in Boston. I know that for a fact for Boston. Um, and there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of neat opportunities here. And this is the only city in the country that has big research labs from Google, Apple, Disney, Intel. I think even Yahoo now has a, has a lab here. So all of these pieces are beginning to add up to substantial numbers of strong technical people here, along with the existing companies like Bayer and Westinghouse and others that also have some strong technical folks there. Um, a new a tech transfer policy, 5% going piece. I briefly mentioned that. It's great. Pittsburgh still needs better infrastructure, though. There's issues around legal support, understanding what startups are like, uh, what, what that is like. Um, the other thing, big bullet here I should have had here is the financing. We have to go to the coasts in order to get financing. There's very little, I sh shouldn't say this, there is a lot of capital in Pittsburgh, but it goes to the coasts. There are, there are people here who have a tremendous either big limited partners or they have big foundations and they invest in coast companies. If you look at, um, I think it was Google actually, Hillman here in Pittsburgh invested in what became Apple and uh, I believe Google. Um, and you know the money's here, it's just being used elsewhere. But there should be a way to have a few successes here to start generating that here. Uh, also remember the VCs are also, they also report to folks too. They aren't the folks directly with the money, the limited partners are. So they have to work with them in order to uh, get the money in order to fund the company. So there's a lot of folks in the middle there. We need to change the mindset. Pittsburgh is a relatively conservative town when it comes to jobs and money and so forth. People perceive startups as being more risky. In fact, I would argue the opposite. I would say big companies do layoffs. Uh, they change direction. They'll shut down plants um, as much or more than the small companies do. At least in my experience, we're often getting resumes from large companies, not from other small companies. Um, I've had the privilege of doing lots of things around the world, lots of neat places I've been to. This is in the Valley of the Kings of Egypt. Um, I was doing some lighting for the tombs uh, with LEDs. Uh, what I'm more proud of, though, closer to home, is the Couch Bridge and the library. This is all color kinetics, and uh, I was very happy to help participate in that. Uh, what I'm most proud of is my family, we just moved, and uh, this is the mountain of paper, part of the mountain of paper that uh, we, we finished unpacking about six or seven weeks ago, and uh, we've since burned most of it <laughs> without the kids inside. <laughs> so we had a, we've had a great time coming back to Pittsburgh and meeting everyone, uh, people I haven't seen in years, and it's been a, a lot of fun. I hope I can share with you. We didn't set up a lot of appointments today, but I'd love to, if you have questions or want to contact me, uh, Sanji, Matt, and many others here have contact information. It's easy to get a hold of me. No, I'll be here for a while.